everybody, welcome to Bones Collector, and today on the Bones Collector we're going to start a special series of videos about our top 100 games. And it was a very hard list to make because there are, I think, I don't know, 80, 90,000 uh, titles on Board Game Geek. So there's a lot of board games out there, and I have not played them all. I don't know anyone who has, but I've played a lot, a lot, a lot of board games. And this is my uh, list of my top 100s. But here's what I want to tell you about this list, first of all, is that I personally have no connection to the board game industry whatsoever. I don't receive any board games from people for free. All the games you see, I researched um, through online and through various other resources and decided whether that game would be something that I wish to play. And then I would purchase that game somehow whether it be at a board game store, my local board game store, Amazon, uh, virtual flea markets, or board game flea markets themselves at uh, conventions, which by the way is a great way to get games. Uh, that's the way I acquired these games. And also, these games are all light to medium. Well, not all. 90% of them are light to medium in complexity. There are some that, and I'll tell you which ones, have a little bit more going on. But for the most part, uh, Laura and I like to play games that are, are light to medium. Uh, because if one of us says, hey, let's play such and such board game, and you're not excited about it, you better think about whether you want that board game in your library. Most of the games that I'm going to show you are games that if one of us says, hey, let's play this game, the other one says, hey, great, let's play it. Even if we're tired, even if it's, uh, we have a short period of time, we still are excited to play that game. And that's how you know you're on the way to making a board game library that will satisfy you and bring you uh, joy and happiness in this hobby. So that's what I use to make this list. Also, there is no LCGs, living card games, no CCGs, collectible card games, and no legacy games on this list, aka Pandemic Legacy. I don't care for those styles of games for various reasons. They cost a lot to do. And in the, in the case of a Pandemic Legacy, per se, it goes into the landfill after you're done playing it. So I don't care for that, and so I'm, I don't promote those games. Enough said about that. If you want to watch my Pandemic Legacy Season 1 video, please do, and you'll get my full feeling on that game. So here we go. Let's start this list of my top 100 board games. And <laughs> here's number 100, and it's called Colony. Colony is put out by Bezier Games, and it's uh, Ted Allspach, who owns Bezier, I believe, and a couple other designers, a guy Hojo and Nakatsu. So he had a couple of co-designers on this game, and Colony I've had for quite a while. Lori and I love to play this game. I'm going to show you inside the box, and it plays one to four, so it has a solo mode. Plays in 60 minutes. Uh, it doesn't take us that long at two player, but that's one of the reasons why I love it so much and I want to show you inside the box it's very similar to Dominion if you guys are familiar with Dominion but it has a couple rows of all these cards and those are the cards you're going to use to build the market where you're going to be taking cards it's an engine building game and you're trying to build an engine to score 20 points and that's the scoreboard First player to put their marker on 20 points wins the game, and I love that. There's no bonus points to figure up at the end of the game. You don't get anything else other than what you earn during the game, and as soon as a player puts his marker on 20, game's over. You've either won or you've lost, and I love that. It's a race to 20 points, and you get some beautiful dice in this game. Those are stable dice. The clear dice are unstable dice. And that is a lot of fun, you guys. And you're going to have an engine that you're going to be building. On each card, it has orange dots, and that's how many points that card is worth. If you have the card played on this side up, it's worth one point because you see that orange dot. If you have it played this side up, you see the orange dots, that's two points. So that's how you, you can keep track of your score. If you don't know where you're at, you just go through your engine and count the orange dots, and you'll see how many points that you you have and there's all kinds of cards in here so the game is different every time and you have a deck of randomizers you start out the market I believe don't quote me but I believe it's with six 
uh, decks of cards that are going to be in every game and then you're going to choose some at random using the randomizer cards as to which cards are going to be uh, in that game for that particular game and that's what makes the game different every time and we just love this game I love to play it I love to chuck dice you're gonna roll the dice and you can only store so many of them unless you upgrade your warehouse which is very very important to do right away so you're, you have a, a group of cards that you start out with and you're going to be upgrading them as you go to make them more powerful and buying cards from the market to, uh, to be able to make some great combinations and I'm telling you I've lost this game when I thought I had it won Oop, and there's directions but many times we've played this and I've had my uh, point marker on 19 on the scoreboard and Lori might be on 15 and she pulls off a great combo on her turn and gets five points, hits 20, and beats me 20 to 19. It's happened so many times, and that's what makes board gaming fun, and that's what makes Colony a blast. I talk about it all the time. I don't know if uh, it gets as much buzz as it deserves, but Bezier Games does a great job. You'll see them as a publisher further uh, up the list as we go in this top 100, and they do a, did a great job with this game. I wish they would come out with a just an expansion pack of of market cards doesn't need anything else just some other market cards some other combo cards that you can just put in this box and uh, not, not some big expansion like like they like to do but uh, just a deck of cards but yeah that's Colony from Bezier Games it's a wonderful game number 100 and we're on the way okay number 99 Las Vegas Royale from Aaliyah Games and it is designed by Rudiger Dorn you're going to hear Rudiger Dorn's name further up this list more than once uh, and I've said this so many times in my videos if you find a board game designer that you like in other words I like this game I love I love playing Las Vegas Royale it's by a guy named Rudiger Dorn so whenever he makes a game I'm going to check into it because I have so much enjoyment from this game that I'm going to be interested in everything else that he does and it just as a matter of fact he's one of the best board game designers around and I like his games a lot and Las Vegas Royale is another dice game and it's such a great amount of fun I think it was issued the first time it was just called Las Vegas but, uh, but this is the like a Royal Deluxe Edition and it's still available on Amazon and you get all these beautiful dice each player is going to have a certain color of dice the dice are all the same for each player and each player let's say you're the yellow player you're going to have a handful of yellow dice eight dice but one of them is twice as big as the other and it counts for two and this is an area control game where you're going to roll the dice in this tray and you have to choose one number so if, if you roll three sixes maybe you want to use sixes but it depends on what's going on around this board and it looks like this uh, he'd take the time to set this up. I'm going to take a little bit of more time with this uh, with this video just to show you guys how the, some of these games work. But it's an area control game, and you have cards with money values on them. There'll be two at every number. So this goes one through six. There'll be two cards at every number, uh, different different money values, and you're going to place your dice in these areas and try to get control so that you get the cards that are in that area and of course after so many rounds at the end of the game you're going to add it up whoever's got the most money wins the game it is so cool because you just have to make tough choices do I want to go for the threes with my double do I want to use it there even though there's somebody already there with two threes if I use my double later on I can roll another three can I take that chance and put it there and get that ninety thousand dollar card those are the decisions that come in uh, to play in this game and then also you get these things that you can put around and we just play the base game when I'm introducing it to new people which is just a lot of fun just the way it is but then you have these boards you can put around here that changes the game in some other way and I think you use two or three of them, uh, I think three. So they're double-sided, so it's a lot of uh, variability in this game. And it changes the game in some way, every one of these boards. So um, a lot is going on at that point if you use these boards. And it changes things to the point where you have to do a little more thinking. And that makes it a, uh, a little more fun and a little more interesting. But 
It's an excellent game. It's just plain fun, folks. And that's what board gaming is all about. I love this game. We, we uh, like I say, I play it with new players all the time, and we have a great time with it. You get them beautiful dice that come with the game. So it's two to five players, 45 to 60 minutes. I don't think it takes that long, a two player even, but uh, um, it's a lot of fun. As soon as I saw this game played, I knew it was for me, and I enjoy it. Las Vegas Royale by Rudiger Dorn. That was number 99. Yeah, that's a great game. Number 98 is going to be a scaled down version of a bigger board game. The bigger board game was called Dinosaur Island. The scaled down version is a two player only game called Dulasaur Island. And it's the same universe as Dinosaur Island. And we had Dinosaur Island, but Dinosaur Island uh, was a wonderful game, played well at two players, but it was a table eaten hog, let me tell you. And it took up a lot of space and it got to the point where we just didn't feel like setting that up. And once I saw this, Duelisaur Island, I thought, well, you know what? It sounds, duel sounds like you're fighting each other. Uh, so I was kind of wondering and iffy if it was going to be a game where you just have a ton of player interaction and you take that all the time, but well, it isn't. It's a wonderful game in the vein of Dinosaur Island. It's a, uh, a game where you're going to be doing the same things, trying to acquire DNA in order to build certain dinosaurs. And of course, if you build those dinosaurs, you're going to have to uh, raise your security level because a threat is going to get higher because of the dinosaurs that you're putting in your park. And uh, I think the, uh, the game ends when you have a certain number of visitors to your park. And that would be on this board, I believe, yeah, visitors as to when you end the game. So that's pretty cool. That's the scoreboard. And then you have double layer player boards. Again, two players only, so that you have uh, markers for your DNA and markers for your threat level and your security level over here. And the rule book is fantastic. I love the rule book, and I say this all the time, look how large the print is in that rule book. And when you get to be my age, you appreciate that kind of thing. I love that rule book. And the thing I love the most about this game is one of the things I loved about Dinosaur Island, and that's these big, chunky amber dice that you get to roll. Every, every side has a different face, and it, the first player is going to pull five of those out of the bag and uh, set them on the board, and you're going to start drafting those dice, and you draft your specialist cards at the same time, and that's what is going to give you some special benefits. You get a deck of park cards, you got tokens for money, and, and um, you have a deck of starter cards and specialists, like I talked about, and then you have an AI, so this is, yeah, this has a solo mode, I don't know if I mentioned that or not, Then your markers that come with it for your, um, for your player boards. So yeah, a lot, a lot in this game, and it's a lot of fun. Lori and I loved it immediately. We played it at a convention because we didn't know if we'd like it. And I always tell you guys to go, go to your local convention, uh, look it up online. There's conventions all over the country. It's a wonderful resource to use to, for you to try to play games that you think you might like, but you don't want to buy them. You know, because maybe they're expensive or, or you don't want to buy them, you don't have space, so you want to be very careful about what you bring in your house. So it's a wonderful resource to be able to go to a convention, play those games, and then also at those conventions, they usually have a flea market where you can pick up board games that you want very cheap. And sometimes they have a virtual flea market, which is they do at the ones we go to. But that's Dulasaur Island. Did I mention the designer? Designed by Ian Moss. Published by Pandasaurus Games, who also did Dinosaur Island. But yeah, it's a lot of fun. Lori and I like this better. It's better for us than Dinosaur Island, just because it plays quicker, it's smaller, smaller footprint on the table, and we do everything at two-player. All of these games <laughs> have to play well at two. It's a wonderful game, Dinosaur Island. Okay, and we got number 97, Camel Up. Camel Up was designed by Stefan Bogan. And it won the Spiel des Jahres in 2014, and for good reason. I mean, it's a wonderful game. It's a racing game. It plays two to eight players in 20 to 30 minutes. How wonderful is that? Eight and up. And Lori and I 
have played this with so many people and I can't remember a time when we played Camel Up where we weren't laughing hysterically. And isn't that what board gaming is all about? This is a random game. Let me tell you, you have very little control in this game. These camels race around frantically jumping on each other's backs and they ride each other to the finish line and you don't know who's going to win. You, you have to place a bet on which camel you think is going to come in last. You get to place a bet on which camel you think is going to come in first and you have no idea and you have to decide when to do that. So some of these decisions can get pretty agonizing. Uh, uh, the, the white camel's in the lead, should I bet on him? But the blue camel is right behind him, should I bet on him to win? And then the orange camel's all the way at the back, should I bet on him to lose? Well, I guarantee you, you bet on that orange camel to lose, he's gonna win. Because, I mean, it's just the way this game works. If they jump on each other's back and when the uh, camel on the bottom, it's his turn to move, He's going to take all the camels with him. So you have no idea how this race is going to come out. And in this box you get, and the one thing I love about this game is the dice dispenser. This is the first edition, by the way. Uh, Lori and I liked it better than the second edition. The newer edition has a larger board. And you know how I am. I like the smaller board, and that's that with, what the board looks like. And the new one's got a pop-up palm tree. It's very pretty. And it's very nice, and it's... Uh, misshapen, it's got, it's not square like this, but uh, we like the smaller board. Uh, it makes uh, it's just better for us. And then this is the pyramid that you're going to use to dispense dice, and you simply turn it over like this and drop one of those dice. And that's how that's the camel that's going to move. Yeah, oh man, we have the best time playing this game. And there's money and cards in here, and uh, you're going to be a certain character, and then. Here's our camels, and we have some screen printed camels that we got extra that we've introduced into our game, kind of trick it out a little bit because it's one of those games. Here's the tiles that you're, the betting tiles that you're going to use, and it's just one of those games that you know immediately you're going to play the rest of your life because it's so much fun and everybody's laughing and having a good time and you don't ever have to feel bad about a decision that you make in this game because it's so random. You, you can't blame yourself for the way uh, things come out. It's just the way this game is. But it's a blast because of it, not in spite of it. And it's a wonderful game. Camel Up, I can't recommend it highly enough. And I, again, it'll be in our library forever. I just love Camel Up. Number 96 is a small game that came out, I believe, in 2019. And the lid's on upside down because we do that in my house. Yeah. <laughs> It's called Draftosaurus. Draftosaurus was designed by Antoine Bauza, Corentin Lebrat, Ludovic, Ma Blanc, A. Tier, and Tierra, Teo Revere. I've slaughtered all those names. Antoine Bauza designed Seven Wonders, one of our favorite board games. And Draftosaurus came out in two, 2019. Yeah, this is one of our favorite games of that year. And in it is simply going to be a wooden dice, a whole bag of wooden dinosaurs of different colors, and you have some player boards, a rule book, one, two, three, four, okay, so it plays five, okay, two to five players, eight and up, and it plays in 15 minutes, and that's all it takes, and I love a game that makes you think hard in 15 minutes, who doesn't, that, I mean, you can play this anytime, you don't have to be well rested, you can just whip this game out and play it, and it's a lot of fun, each player board has two sides, summer and winter, and you play both sides, add up the summer and winter scores, and whoever has the highest score for both sides of the board wins the game. And it's simply that. You're going to be rolling a die, and that's going to tell you where you have to place a dinosaur. And that can be agonizing because you, there's certain ways you have to place them. Maybe they all have to be different. Maybe they all have to be alike. Maybe they have to be lovers and they have to be in the love cage. They have to be uh, together. And you have to decide where you place those things. And the dice make tells you where. Only the player, is, the player that rolls it doesn't have to use it. Just just the other players that have to use the, the location that shows up on the die. So you can you're agonizing over whether to spend those dinosaurs. And you're going to have a handful of them. I must tell you, this Draftosaurus bag didn't come with the game. We bought that later, after we knew we were keeping this game. 
but you have a handful of different colored and different styled dinosaurs I might add T-Rexes and Stegosauruses and so forth and you have to decide where you're going to put those and when you're going to place those and then once you select those of course in a two-player game it, there's a variant we have to place one of the dinosaurs and discard another into the box so you have to get rid of two dinosaurs out of your hand and then when you're done with your turn you pass, pass them to the other player and that can hurt because you have to decide oh what do I want to, what do I want to do because I can see what they're doing I don't want them to have this dinosaur but I'm going to give it to them if I choose these for my board or if I choose this one for my board and discard this one I'm still giving them some, I don't want to give them anything they want for their board, so I want to make sure when I'm discarding one that, that I uh, discard one that they might want, but there's a lot of fun decisions uh, in playing this game. Tiny player boards, no main board, so you're just playing everything on here, and folks, it's a lot of fun. Draftosaurus came out in 2019, and we enjoy it and continue to enjoy it. It's just a wonderful little game that uh, you can play in 15 minutes, and it's in my top 100, so what, what can I say? The rule book is very easy to understand, and is that all I want to say about Draftosaurus? I think it is. It's a wonderful game, lots of fun. That's why it's where it, where it is, and that's the box. And there's the back of the box. I've been meaning to show the back of the box. There's the back of the box. I haven't done very good with that. So, yeah. Draftosaurus. Number 95. Number 95 is a game by Phil Walker Harding called Cacao. That's the front of the box. That's the back of the box. Yeah, Phil Walker Harding, you're going to hear his name further up the list. Again, a designer that I've come to respect and has done some wonderful games that we really enjoy. Some medium complexity, light complexity games. This one's rather light. Doesn't stop us from loving it. Um, it plays two to four players in 45 minutes. I don't think I think it takes us about a half hour at two player at the two player count. And this is what's in the box. You have a water carrier player board, one for each player, different colors. And then you have tiles. You're going to have your own hand of tiles. So if you're the red player, all your tiles are going to be red on the back. And then when you're placing them in the middle of the board, each tile has a certain number of workers on it. As you can see this one has one worker on two different sides and two workers on one side. So when you place this, wherever you place it, you get the benefit depending on how many workers are facing that other tile that you place it next to on the board. So if I wanted two cacao, if I needed two cacao to do something in this game, I would want to place this tile against the cacao uh, tile with the two workers touching it, then I would get two cacao. And then if I place it accordingly, uh, it's the other tiles that it's touching, where I have the one worker sides, I get the benefits of those tiles one time. So that's the way this game works. And it goes very quickly. And you have a stack of your, your tiles that are your color, and I think you draw two into your hand at a time. I think you've got two. So if you draw something, maybe your, your tile that has three workers on it, which I think you only have one or two, and you don't want to use that yet, you just keep saving it. So you play the other tile, place that on the board uh, in the village. I think you're building a village. And you're placing that in the village and then holding on. You can hold on to that tile until you're ready to, to play that one with the three workers on it and maybe get water to drive up your water carrier up your water board. Because if you Notice on here, your water carrier starts out with negative 10 points. It's a little meeple guy. That's the red one. And then negative 10, negative 4, negative 1. So you want to keep moving that water carrier up. The only way to do it is to place some tiles with workers against a water tile on the board. So you can't ignore that. This is part of the game. And then especially if your opponent gets all the way up to 16 points, you better match them. Or you, or you're going to be left out in the dark. So yeah, that's uh, that's the way cacao works. You get some wonderful wooden cacao. You get uh, 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 meeples of all the different colors in here that have spilled all over. They have a wonderful insert in the box where all the pieces go. But there you go. Yeah, that's the box insert. It has a place for the tiles and it has a place for your meeples. And your cacao and money go in these slots. We keep them in bags because we don't want them falling all over. 
Uh, if you use the insert in this box, you have to lay the game down flat when you store it, and we don't. So, um, yeah, we uh, leave it in like that, and will that work? Yeah, there we go. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Phil Walker Harding's Cacao. Again, a 30 minute playtime, and we really, really love Cacao. Number 94 is going to be a game called Ancient and Terrible Things. Ancient and Terrible Things, designed by Simon McGregor and Rob Vanz Vanzel. Put out by Pleasant Company Games. It says a pulp horror dice game, and it is a dice game. I really don't like horror games, um, per se. Uh, games that have graphic horror on the cards or anywhere in the game. And I, I stay away from those kinds of things. If you've watched my videos, you know that's a fact. You know, if you have a card in your game where a monster is ripping out somebody's heart, I'm not going to play that game. I'm not going to waste my time or my money, for sure, playing that game. But this game is called a, a pulp horror game because it's kind of got that cartoony art. And that's the rule book. It's in the box. And I'll try and remember to show you the back of the box. But you get some dice that you're going to roll. You get a bunch of tokens, terrible thing tokens, character reroll tokens, decks of cards, swag cards, ominous encounter cards. And you're trying to fulfill encounters uh, on the board by matching the, uh, the dice requirement when it's rolled. And you each get a player board and a silica pack. You get that. <laughs> it's a must in every board game. And then uh, a beautiful board. And I was able, believe it or not, yeah, there's the board. Your counter cards are going to go here, I believe. And then it's going to tell you what dice value on those cards you have to roll in order to take those cards and get the points for them. So um, it's a very, very fun game because of the dice rolling. And this game we've had for quite a while, and it's one that I play every October because of the theme. And again, I like it because it's a horror game that isn't horrible. And as, as far as the theme is concerned, and we really enjoy it. And as you can see, we put all of our tokens in these little plastic uh, disc containers to, to make it just a little more fun. And we tricked it out a little bit, and we really love it. And I was saw this game on Amazon, I kept watching it, for whatever reason, I was just, one day I got on there and they had marked it down to 17 bucks and I grabbed it and not only did I grab it, or my wife Lori posted on Facebook uh, to tell everybody that you could get this game for $17 and a couple other people on Facebook was able to get it and it's always a pleasure to help others uh, acquire a nice board game for a uh, rather inexpensive price. So that's Ancient and Terrible Things. There's the back of the box. I promise I'd try and show that. Yeah, so pretty cool. A uh, nice heavy cardboard box. Again, all the components in the in the game are excellent. And Ancient Terrible Things is in our top 100. We're down to number 93. Number 93 is a game called Habitats. This is a second edition by Corna Van Morsel and Koalavi Games. We picked this game up at a convention because it's a rather difficult to find. I don't know if it is now, but it, it was at the time. And it might be still pretty pretty hard to find. And it's about exactly that, animal habitats. That's a lovely theme, isn't it? And I really, really enjoy that type of thing in board gaming. And I, I love uh, real world type of themes and, and uh, that kind of thing when I'm playing board games. So uh, this plays two to five players, uh, ages 10 and up, in about 40 minutes. I don't think it takes us that long. And there's the back of the box. That's what it looks like. Uh, this game looks like when you're playing it. Um, you're trying to place your animals in a certain way so that you can maximize your points. And I think they have to have water and that kind of thing. And it tells you on the tiles the requirements that that animal needs in order to be in his natural habitat. And it's really a cool game because you have to think, and I love the, the selection mechanism. You're going to have a, a gardener or a farmer. Each player gets one of his color. And that gardener or farmer is going to lay down flat in the market and you get to select the tile okay you're going to select the tile that's at either arm or his head and so once you select that tile you move him into that space take that tile and place it in your habitat and then the next turn 
you can choose the tile that's at his head or either arm. Now that sounds repetitive, except when you get on the outside border of, let's say this guy was laying on the corner, there wouldn't be a tile at his head, there wouldn't be one at his left arm, there would only be one at his right arm. So you only have one choice at that point. So you gotta watch where you're selecting your tiles and where you're moving that guy. So that's the planning phase in that market. You're really gonna have to think about, let's see, I want that lion but it's way over there. How do I get over there without, and, and use the tiles that I have to select to get over the, to get that one, because I need that in my habitat. So yeah, you have to think about that all the time you're moving this guy around, that's really cool. I really, really enjoyed this game. I saw, I think I saw Rado play it back when, uh, you know, back in the day. And uh, <laughs> he recommended it highly, and I trusted him at that point, and yeah, it's a great game. You get some bunch of wonderful tiles in the game. You also get some tiles that give you bonuses for the way that you're building your habitat. So that's pretty cool. And this game, I don't know when it came out, but yeah, Habitats, it's a wonderful tile laying game that has been in our library for at least two years. And we really, really enjoy it. Habitats, that was number 90 something three. All right, we're on number 92. And number 92 is a game called Steam Time. And guess who it's by? That's right, Rudiger Dorn. Remember, he did Las Vegas Royale on this same part of the top 100. Again, I had to check this game out because of who designed it. And I checked it out because it was on sale. And that means a lot to me too. So I researched it and decided I wanted to try to play this game. So I, I bought it, I was, I, relatively inexpensive, I forget. $17.25. And there's a lot in this box, ladies and gentlemen, number one. Number two, let's see, it plays two to four players, ages 12 and up. Playtime is 90 minutes. I think it's a little less than that at two. There is a lot to this game, though. Of all the 10 games I'm showing you today, this is the meatiest of the, of the games. And um, it's very, very good, but it takes a lot of thought. So, let's see what I want to do. That's the front of the box. It's, the year is 1899. That's your steamship. And what has happened, and this is a look at the game as it's being played on the back, and, and around the world at some of the world monuments like Stonehenge and what are other pyramids or something, all, all these monuments around the world, some time rifts, some strange things are happening, and governments are realizing that they can travel through time by getting in, in this time rift thing at the monuments. So uh, all the governments of the world are trying to gain power by going back in time and uh, learning things or going forward in time and getting gathering knowledge, and they want to become the most powerful. The scoring track is called Esteem, so you want to get as many Esteem points as you can get in this game. On the board, it's a modular board, and that's why I really, really enjoy it, because it's the same mechanism they use in Selenia, and I love Selenia, but in Steam Time, these, this is the modular board pieces, and you, I th think you use six of them in the game. And as the game goes on, once each round is finished, the top one comes out and goes on the bottom and pushes the rest of them up. And during the game, when you're placing your steamships and you have three of them, you have to choose. There's six actions on every one of these six boards. So that's 36 actions you get to choose from. You cannot choose one that another player has chosen, and you can't choose one where on the same board you have already placed an airship. You must move up in time in order to take another action. So you have to think about that. If you're taking your first airship and it's your first action, your first turn of the round, you can't place it on the top, even though you might need something desperately on that top piece. If you put your airship there, you're done because you can't place any more airships above it. So you have to think hard, oh, well, I need that badly, but I'll wait till the next round because guess what? It's going to come down to the bottom next round. So you have to, it's, those are tough choices you have to make in this game. And it's ridiculously difficult to do that because there's so much going on. You have expeditions that you go on, uh, encounter cards that you deal with, you have different colored crystals, you have clear crystals that are wild and you can use for anything. Again, there's a lot in this box. The box, box weighs a little bit because of everything that's in here. And then the board itself looks like... You know, I don't know if, if you were able to gather that from the back, but it's in an, 
Um, you know, I was going to say L shape, but that's an upside down L. <laughs> so it's not an L shape. But it's like that. And then your six boards go here. And like I say, you're going to place your airships on one of those six actions on one of those boards. And then you have to place, go up in time for your next selection. And that's where the meat of this game comes in. And it's a whole lot of fun. And on your player board, this is your steamship player board. And you place crystals that you're going to acquire off those boards in these holes and the more you have filled up when you do that benefit the next time like this is your bank so if you have uh, three of these filled up the next time you go to the bank you're going to get three gold instead of just uh, one and you have to place the crystals of those colors so those those have to be orange those got to be pink those got to be the green crystals and those got to be the blue crystals and I I forget what you put there. I think wild. But you can use wild on any of those spaces also. So that's pretty cool. And this game is so amazing. And I had not heard much about it. Games like this, it just seems like this game just didn't get a lot of buzz. It didn't get a lot of credit that it deserves. I think it came out in 2015 or 16. And um, I'm here to tell you it deserves a lot more buzz than it's getting and there's a lot of games that are coming out this year that can't touch Steam Time. I'm going to tell you that right now. This is a great game you guys and again it's a little more complex than anything else I've showed you today. Nothing you can't handle. You have to, you're going to have to you know, go through the rule book and it's, very, it's a very good rule book tells you, uh, you know, telling you how to play the game but the thing, uh, one of the things I really like about this rule book is on the back it tells you uh, about each encounter card and each, each expedition. It has famous people on the encounter cards like Alfred Nobel, Swedish chemist and inventor of dynamite, founder and eponym of the Nobel Prize. So yeah. Then Archimedes of Syracuse, Greek mathematician, physicist and mechanic, considered inventor of burning mirror, pulley and irrigation system. So it goes all the way down every one of those encounter cards and tells you who those people are. I, I love games that do that. It's It, it just it, it sucks you in. It, it, you have more invested in the game uh, when you get a chance to read the rule book and, and pick up this kind of information. So I really, really like that. Nice draw bag comes with the game. And then these are my cheater notes because every time in every game we have, you might see these sheets when I'm doing my reviews because uh, Lori goes through and she makes little cheater notes for us so that when we get the game out again, we don't have to read the whole rule book. We just, we just read all the highlights and we're up and running. So that's Steam Time by Rudiger Dorn, and I love this game, oh my gosh. And hopefully you guys can pick it up and, and, uh, and have a lot of fun with it. Okay, my last game of the day, number 91, is a game called Turia. Turia is designed by Inca and Marcus Brand and Michael Reinick. Gosh, let me see if I can get this right. Inca and Marcus Brand, very good board game designers. Same year, I believe, they came out with Raja of the Ganges, and there's another game that I have in my library called My Village that's designed by them and there's another game that's going to be in up further up the list that they design I'm not going to I'm not going to do the spoiler thing I'm not saying what it is but Inc and Marcus Brand they're wonderful board game designers and Turia um, is has a unique mechanism in it that I really really love and it's why I keep this game and that's the front of the box let's see what it says it plays two to four in 60 minutes ages 10 and up that's the back of the box. That's what the board looks like. It's got kind of some... I don't know who the art is buying this. It looks like the guy did Agricola. I mean, it looks similar to that kind of art. I'll probably get in trouble for saying that. Somebody will say, no, it's not the guy. I didn't look it up. Though. And here's the rule book for Toria. Very good rule book. Explains everything in detail how to, how to play this game. It's in German there, too, if you want to play it in German. It plays differently in German. <laughs> Anyway, here's all the stuff you get in the game. You get uh, a dice, a draw bag of crystals. These are money tokens. We keep them in little containers. Hearts, you gotta have hearts in this game. And the spinning towers. That's the thing, folks. That's the thing that makes this game special, those spinning towers. And this game, I would say this game is light. Yeah, it's a light game. But I don't know. It's just wonderful and fun to play it. And one of the things that's fun to play it is you are all the same avatar. It reminds me of Dorothy and her friends when they were going through Oz. But that's what it looks like. You know, it's on a little stand. And you are going to move that to pick up crystals or to do an action on the board. And guess what? 
the next player, when it's his turn, he's going to move the same avatar. So <laughs> you're going to have this happen to you where somebody's going to move that away from something you want to do. And that really pains you. So you're like, oh my gosh, don't do that. But they move it to a place you don't want it to go. And you're going to have to try to, on your turn, move it in the direction you want to go in to do the thing you want to do. Because it's more important to do the stuff you want to do always in this life. That's the way life is. Do the stuff you want to do. So anyways, the spinning towers all sit on the corners of the board like this. Whoops. I got upside, yeah, I got upside down. So they sit on the board like this. And each uh, facing of the tower has a different action to take. And you have four of these. And it depends on where you're sitting at the table. So if you're sitting over, you know, these four towers are sitting like this. If you're sitting over there, oh, stay, stand up now, you coward. All right, if you're sitting over there, you can choose from this action, that action, that action, and that action. You have four choices of the towers that are facing you. The facing of that tower, where, where it fa wherever you're sitting at the table, that's the actions you choose from. And you would then choose, let's say, okay, I'll take, I'm gonna take this yellow action. This player says, I'm gonna take the yellow action, this is what I'm gonna do. Then he has to spin the tower one time because he took the action of that tower. And that goes on throughout the entire game. Every time someone takes that action, they got to spin that tower the direction there's arrows on the top. Shows you which direction to spin it. And then a new action becomes available to everyone. But it, you'll, you'll run into this where like, you'll have the same action on a couple of towers and you don't need any of that. So it's you have to kind of plan how you want to spin those towers. You have to think about when you want to do those things. So that's pretty cool. It adds some twist to the game. Uh, the board is pretty and the object of the game is to get to the middle and you have to have uh, certain things when you get there because you're going to be turning over some tiles that are up here. You're looking for the prince or the princess to ask for their hand in marriage. So that's the game and it's a darling game. I enjoy the heck out of this game. It's again a light game but lots of fun to play because of the spinning towers and the fact that you're all moving the same avatar. That I, Gosh I can't think of I have another game that does that as far as that uh, using the same avatar because that can be so aggravating when someone moves that thing to some place when you're trying to go to another place and that makes this game so stinking interesting and, and so much fun so nice. yeah all right, there we go. And that is 91 through 100 of my top 100. I'm glad to have done that for you today. I love every one of these games, you guys, or I wouldn't tell you about them. Uh, again, if you watch my channel, I don't do, I don't tell you about things that are negative. There's a lot of games, a lot of games that Laura and I play that are just not good or even horrible. And you know, we've played them at conventions and we're like, oh my gosh, that game was bad. Um, and I just don't tell you about those things because I don't want to waste your time because it's very important and I don't want to waste my time. I love every one of you. Thanks for watching today. I'll try and get the next batch out as soon as possible. Please like, please subscribe. And by all means, keep board gaming. It's the best hobby on the planet. I'll see you the next time on The Bones Collector. I love every one of you. Bye-bye.